Greetings, everyone. Welcome again to another edition of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program Teacher Certification Course. If you're joining us here in at headquarters, uh, you can be seated. And wherever you're joining us, welcome. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> On this really cool Texas day, you know, it's you know, I heard today the weather said it was 10,000 degrees on the surface of the sun, so I'm very thankful, you know, it's only 105 here. <laughs> Remember, it always could be worse. What, what's that positive character trait? Optimism? <laughs> okay. So, uh, welcome again. We're, uh, we're going to be covering, um, if you're joining us, Online, you can go to the top of the Facebook page. There's a drop down menu of the manuals. We are in the fifth manual of the intermediate series entitled Responsibility. It's the last in the uh, in that uh, series, intermediate junior high series of the Peaceful Solution program before we get into the uh, high school series. We are in the seventh chapter, which is the last chapter of the book entitled you can be responsible for your safety you can be responsible for your safety you know it got me to thinking you know about the weather even like even with the hot weather preparing for hot weather when we look at the weather report usually you can see about 10 days ahead you know they have a 10-day forecast and it kind of tells you what to expect and sometimes it shows you it's going to be 105 degrees so preparation for that 105 degrees is is critical. That's why I'm drinking my cold coffee right now, and um, not getting enough water. I noticed um, <laughs> I need to uh, start chugging that water down some more. Okay, so remember, stay hydrated, hydrated as David tells us. You know he's up here hydrating as he's teaching, and uh, it's important to stay hydrated. But that's all part of preparation for safety purposes. That's what we're learning about in the Peaceful Solution, this chapter. And um, we did leave off, I don't know if my screen's working here. Is this working, Michael? This is black. Um, okay, so I did bring some slides again for us. In fact, I got a lot of slides tonight. We also have some videos we gotta watch. Um, <clears throat> We're going to be uh, uh, picking up where we left off. If you recall, it was on page 129, but as usual, we always do a review, a quick review of what we've learned in the last class. Remember, we're, we learned, we went over the uh, introduction last time. Um, you can be responsible for your safety. We went over the note to the teacher, uh, and we started, we learned about uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and terrorist attacks are only some disasters that can threaten our safety and security. That's on Lesson Plan 7A. Lesson Plan page 7, page A. It's in the note to the teacher. And uh, it says that as devastating as these natural and man-made disasters can be, we don't have to sit idly by powerless to protect our lives and property. You know, we can prepare for these things. But first, we have to educate ourselves on what to expect from these disasters, then prepare for ourselves and our families. And we talked about the concepts we're going to cover in this uh, particular chapter about basic necessities and, and gathering these basic necessities for our survival, the importance of being informed about changing conditions, including the weather, but also the conditions of you know, man's relationships with man. You know, you got a lot of wars going on right now. There's wars brewing everywhere, and there's talk of thermonuclear conflict. So you got to stay up to date on what's taking place in the world, okay? You have to watch the news, be, be informed, um, take it seriously. Um, the extent of damages, we also were going to cover the extent of damages that can be expected from both natural and man-made disasters, how to prepare an emergency kit, and also the importance of storing non-perishable uh, food items and non-food items as well. And uh, let's go to the first slide because I think that's the procedure we left off on, procedure number two 
where it says, and let's go back, if you want to follow on procedure two in your book, it's on lesson plan seven, page C, but it's also up on the screen for those watching at home. It says, inform students that in today's lesson, we're gonna learn how they can be responsible for their safety when disaster strikes. Explain that we are living in a time when weather patterns across our country can be extreme. And these extreme changes in the weather have resulted in dangerous tropical storms, tornadoes, tsunamis, and flooding. In addition to these natural disasters, we're also faced with the threat of man-made disasters in the form of terrorism. And tells us to turn to page 129, which we were doing the last time. By the way, that picture you're looking at on, on the screen there, that's one of those big uh, uh, windmills, you know, that you see all over Texas here in West Texas, I think they cost. Uh, I think Chris told me they cost about one one point two million dollars a piece. Uh, that's what a tornado can do to one of those <laughs> big big uh, w uh, wind generators that we have everywhere. You know, there there's thousands of them. You know, I thought when I when I drove through Los Angeles and Palm Springs back in uh, late 1990s. They were just everywhere. There was no end to them. But now in West Texas, I think we're, we've surpassed even that area now in wind energy. But that's what a tornado can do to one of those. Snapped it like a, bent it like a, like a straw, okay? Uh, that's how powerful they are. And, you know, you see that house that's upended there. That's from a tornado, okay? Just the recently here in 2024, these pictures, that one's in Iowa. Uh, these are both 2024 pictures been having a lot of tornadoes let's go to the next slide so on page 129 at the top is where we left off it says the time to plan is not in the middle of a disaster okay <laughs> that's not the time to plan because remember when disaster strikes the time to prepare has already passed <laughs> okay so the time to prepare is when in the present now not later right and somebody told me after the class last time that saying that I was trying to come up with it's better to have too much than not have enough or better to have than have not you know just think that way you know it, it's better to have things in storage you know because they call it you know, like saving for a rainy day or putting things away for a rainy day so to speak you know yeah you might not need it but you might need it. So wouldn't it be better to have than have not? Yes, it would. Okay, so let's go to the next visual. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so actually, um, before we do that, before we do that, I wanted to show, because it was talking about uh, the uh, tornadoes, uh, speaking of tornadoes, I did have a clip I was going to show you last time, but we ran out of time. So, uh, because it's about nine minutes long, um, but I do want to show it now because I want to show you these extreme weather patterns that they're talking about here that we need to prepare for. You know, and it can occur anywhere. And actually, here in Texas, Texas Tornado Alley here. You know, it's part of Tornado Alley. You know, you got Oklahoma, where Iowa, these types of places. Where's Kansas? You know, uh, these, this is called Tornado Alley, so we should, if it's called Tornado Alley, what do you do? <laughs> you should prepare for tornadoes, right? So, um, and you, you got to take these things seriously. So let's go ahead and play that clip and show some, uh, some of the extreme weather we've been having here in 2024 already. And let's, let's find out why from one of the NOAA scientists, uh, why that is taking place. Let's go ahead and play the clip. We're right in the middle of the tornado, Brenda. What do I do? The car is shaking. Holy My ears are popping. This car! We're in it, we're in it. I can't do anything! Cover your head. Cover your head.
been a very active start to 2024. Now, even though May is typically the most active month for tornadoes, the numbers that we've seen this year, and really going back to the last week of April, have been astounding. Uh, only equaled one other time, and that was during the historic uh, tornado season of 2011. So um, over 1,000 preliminary reports of tornadoes, uh, over 4,200 reports of damaging thunderstorm winds, large hail, and tornadoes. So just a very active start. Um, and while it does show some signs of slowing down just a bit, uh, we're still unfortunately in the heart of severe weather season. Another key ingredient is that we did not have many cold fronts during the winter uh, penetrate into the Gulf of Mexico. And so for that reason, among others, the Gulf of Mexico was quite uh, warm, well above average. And so when you bring those south winds uh, that typically precede severe weather outbreaks, allowing Gulf of Mexico moisture to surge northward, we've seen uh, case after case where the atmosphere is extremely unstable and over a very large area. And that, that's one of the key ingredients for severe storms and tornadoes. And that certainly helps stack the deck in favor of a more active season. One of the key ingredients for any thunderstorm to form is that when an air parcel near the ground lifts, if it's warmer than the surrounding air, it will continue to rise. That, in a general sense, is what instability is. Now, when moisture condenses, it contributes to that process. But in general, the more unstable the atmosphere is, the stronger the updrafts can be, and the more intense the corresponding storm will likely be. And then as these storm systems in the jet stream move from west to east, contributing one of the other key ingredients, which is a change of wind speed and direction with height, helps to structure the storms and uh, contribute to severity, then you begin to see environments like we've seen this year, day after day, repeated areas uh, or repeated severe weather events occurring in the same general area uh, with, with uh, really disastrous consequences. I am in Valley View, Texas, North Texas. This is a home where we uh, believed at least three people were killed. Cook County Sheriff confirming uh, multiple fatalities. We've heard seven, but we're waiting on the news conference to get uh, the exact numbers and some updates. This is some of the damage on Green Meadow Drive here. Storm that came through about 10 o'clock last night. You see people over there picking up the pieces of their lives as it's strewn all across the field, way over there on the other street. Storm came through about 10 o'clock last night. And uh, as it came through, it just really took a toll on this town. Lots and lots and lots and lots of damage. Uh, this is just a couple of neighborhood streets. You can see there that uh, RV on top, pushed on top of it. People have been able to do some clearing out. But it came through about 10 o'clock last night. As a matter of fact, I was talking to um, some survivors of the storm. Uh, Monica Vasquez says that she was holding on to the door with dear life and just saying prayers for her life and for her daughter who lives next door. Her daughter had just come from graduation, graduation ceremony. As a matter of fact, if you look at the video in uh, Monica's interview, there's a watermelon on the table. There were some graduation balloons, you know, things that you would see for a graduation celebration at the table. It's a piece of cake or something on the table. But look, destruction. Well, certainly there's variability from year to year on hail. This year, because of the instability, the extreme amounts of instability in the environment, that's also unfortunately conducive for prolific hail production. If it's a major metropolitan area, you can quickly have a billion dollars in damage from one storm over the course of an hour, you know, anywhere that storm hits. This year, unfortunately, a lot of those storms have hit populated areas. And so while the numbers are still coming in in terms of the, the, the damage losses, um, the large hail that we've seen, baseball, softball, in some cases over five inches in diameter, have certainly caused extreme impacts. <laughs> bottom line, I think, is that it's unclear the extent to which climate change might be playing a role in overall severe weather occurrence. Oh, oh my gosh. Holy s***.
we go, guys. Wind is wind, and when you've got, in the case of Houston, winds of perhaps 100 miles per hour, even locally higher, it doesn't matter whether the winds are rotating or whether they're coming from one uh, pr predominant direction. Winds of that intensity will cause damage to most structures, and so you've got to treat it the same as you would a tornado warning. Take the action, be proactive, get into that uh, central interior space. Below ground is ideal if, if that's available. They got destroyed. They got all the but this entire neighborhood street. I, I mean, I can continue to walk and you'd see more damage on top of more damage. So the interesting thing about the lady who lives over here, she um, she left her home and you can see why uh, to go up to the convenience store, which is not very far from here. That store was basically destroyed. She said that there were about 30 of them, if I remember correctly, who had hunkered down inside of a water cooler. And uh, that's where they rode out the storm. They're alive today to tell the story. So, some amazing stories of survival. It's just hard to see humanity suffer like this sometimes. But when a storm comes through and does what it does, what can you do? But move forward to the next day. Take it one day at a time. So you can see the extreme amount of uh, devastation here in Texas and uh, other Iowa, other places that's been taking place in the last couple of months with the, with the tornadoes and the high winds in Houston, Texas, the flooding in Houston, Texas. As the man said, you know, the Gulf of uh, Mexico is extremely active at this time, very warm. Remember, we had a very uh, uh, early spring this year. And uh, so it's been a, a, a recipe for disaster when it comes to the warm winds colliding with the, with the cold, et cetera. So anyway, um, just to kind of give you an idea about the tornadoes and high winds, and this is the thing we need to be re preparing for in the eventuality these things take place. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And let's start on Chapter 7. You can be responsible for your safety. It said... September 11, 2001 was a tragic day in American history. It was the day two commercial jets crashed into the World Trade Center towers and another plane crashed into the Pentagon, killing many innocent people. Since that day, Americans have been encouraged to be safety-minded and alert because the threat of more tragedies like these loom in the future. More terrorist attacks loom in the future, it says. Tom Ridge, former Secretary of Homeland Security Department, an organization that was started in response to these catastrophes, stated on a public service announcement, quote, it is no longer if terrorists will plan another attack on American soil, but when, unquote. In other words, another attack can occur without warning at any time in any city, town, or state. Okay, so... Uh, you know, right now I know they're 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 on pretty high levels of alert for certain things because of the uh, because of the activities all over the world right now with the war in uh, Israel and Gaza. Uh, there's conflict with Iran. There's conflict with Ukraine and Russia. And you know, if you've noticed in the news, there's even been attacks like in Russia itself. You know, where they had the uh, theater attack. I think it was the Crocus Theater where somebody came in and shot up about 100 people, which is pretty unheard of in a place like Moscow. You know, it's not a, it's not a normal thing, okay? 
Um, so these kind of things can take place because these groups, you know, that want to, that are seeking revenge for what's occurring to their group or their country or their uh, uh, their uh, uh, political affiliation, uh, they lash out. And then you have right now we have some things brewing with. Uh, they're talking about civil wars right here in America with, you know, the political climate the way it is, with President Trump being convicted of, uh, which, you know, the other political party says, you know, uh, <laughs> both parties are kind of wrangling using the courts and using the, using the uh, uh, justice system to go at each other, to punish one another or to uh, attack one another. And... Uh, those things are, are, are recipes for uh, people to get very upset and do things, you know, where even lone wolf attacks, you know, where somebody just gets fed up with the way things are going and they walk in somewhere with a gun or a bomb or, you know, they blow up a federal building like we saw in Oklahoma City back in 19, what, 93, somewhere around there, and, and these other attacks, people get fed up with, because they get caught up in the political climate. That's what we have to be careful of. You know, when you think of preparation, and I meant to tell you this this last time, you know the best preparation that you can make, actually, because aside from the physical preparation that you need to be doing right now, that we need to be doing, you need to prepare your character. <laughs> because if you're for war, in any way, shape, or form, your character's not right you have a character flaw. If you're taking sides, whether it's Democrat or Republican or independent, even if you're straddling the fence, okay, you're on the wrong side. You're supposed to be on the peaceful solution side, which means you don't take sides. Okay? So if we're, we think, well, this political party is better than this political party, hey, Democrat, Republican, two wings, same bird. Okay? Two wings, same bird, man. Okay? And they're all heading one place. <laughs> Down. <laughs> okay? Unless they stop the foolishness and start grabbing hold of these peaceful principles like do not steal. Like... Two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, uh, you know, turn the other cheek, so to speak. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. Treat others with consideration, care, and concern. Remember everything we're learning here, right? If, if they would just grab a hold of those principles that possibly even their parents taught them when they were growing up. They just forgot because they've been so bombarded now with the hatred. There's so much hatred being pushed everywhere now. It's everywhere. Hatred, hatred. You know? And even when they talk about peace, they're showing bombs blowing up. <laughs> right? We're going to have peace as soon as we destroy all this, all these people that don't agree with us. You know? We're going to have peace finally. I'm sorry, but peace and bombs don't go together. Okay? Unless you're talking about pieces, because things get blown to pieces. Right? <laughs> But peace and bombs and guns and force doesn't match. It's not related. <laughs> okay, the only way we're going to have peace is through the peaceful solution and in this training in moral character education. That's the only way. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide. It says, as if the threat of terrorism is not enough, there's also natural disasters in the form of hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, and tornadoes. These natural disasters could also strike with very little warning, damaging property and taking lives like the tsunami that struck the Asian coast in December of 2004. A tsunami is a very large ocean wave caused by an underwater earthquake or volcanic eruption, as we saw the tsunami in uh, Alaska, I showed you in the last time, there was a, in Seward, Alaska, in Valdez, coastal uh, towns, totally wiped out, just totally wiped out. You know, um, 
you know, 70 foot waves coming in, <laughs> you know, who's going to survive that, you know, and um, just horrible. But it mentions the tsunami in 2004, okay, the Asian tsunami. And I, let's uh, go to the next slide. Do I have a map of that? I sure do. This tsunami, this tsunami was so huge, okay, it killed 225,000 people. And you see where, it's, where it hit, India, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, it even spread to Africa. These tsunamis, look at it, the epicenter was there off the coast of Indonesia, but it affected all those areas were hit with tsunamis in 2004. 225,000 people killed by flooding through the water in the tsunamis. In fact, I have a clip I would like to show. Was it? No, it's, I don't have that one. Do I have that one? Let me think. Uh, go to the next slide. I think it might be... Uh, no, go back. Go back. Um, I have... There was another tsunami in 2011. Anybody remember that? Seven years after this one. Seven years after this one, we had the Japan earthquake and the tsunamis that hit afterwards. Remember the Fukushima incident where the power plant, the Fukushima power plant uh, uh, melted down, which I think it's still seeping uh, radioactive matter into the water. <laughs> Uh, and all that radiation has gone out into the oceans, by the way. It had to go somewhere. It went out in the ocean. It's out there now in, in the Pacific Ocean. Let's go ahead and play the clip of the 2011 tsunami. I think it's the one I have. That was 9.1 on the Richter scale, 9.1. Now here comes the tsunami afterwards. You hear the air raid sirens. You hear that? That means get to high ground. See the wave out there coming in, pointing to it. <laughs> That's an 18-foot seawall that that water's going over. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, please Oh, man. Yeah, and I don't remember how many people were killed in that. Possibly Michael can, uh, can look up that statistic on the 2011 tsunami and the earthquake in Japan. First of all, surviving a 9.1 earthquake was shocking enough, you know, but then to have to deal with a, a tidal wave afterwards, horrible business, sir. But these things take place, you know, and then they're, that's, they live, Japan, they call Alaska and Japan, that area, uh, there's a lot of volcanoes, there's a lot of earthquake activity, they call it the ring of fire, actually, it's a very active uh, uh, spot, you know, where, where there's a lot of earthquake activity and volcanic activity. See, I can't read it, I can't read it. 18,000 people killed, it says, in that particular incident. Tsunami only. Tsunami only. Just the tsunami. I don't know about the earthquake. Okay, so back to the uh, 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 next slide. It says, in this chapter, we're going to explore ways you can be responsible for your safety in times of disaster because whether natural or man-made, disasters can be frightening and devastating. And I got to hand it to the Japanese people. They sure seemed quite, a lot of them seemed pretty calm. You know, I didn't hear a lot of screaming and yelling going on in the background for the most part. Um, they got up on, they hear those sirens, they got up into higher ground and they were able to take that footage for us to see. And, and those were the ones that made it to higher ground. I don't, a lot of people didn't make it. Um, it says, um, it says, do you know what you should do in the event of a hurricane, earthquake, or terrorist attack? If you answered no, then it's very important that you learn how to take responsibility for your own safety to avoid a tragedy. Okay, so then that's what we're going to be uh, covering again, uh, covering them tonight in this next part of the class. Let's go ahead and go to page 130. And let's test our knowledge, our disaster knowledge, okay? It says, how much do you know about safety in times of disaster? And uh, I'm going to make sure. No, I, let's, before I have a disaster, let's turn back to page lesson plan 7C. <laughs> lesson plan 7, page C, so I don't skip number 3 here. we got to read step 3 where it tells us that have students complete the quiz, test your disaster knowledge, found on page 130, and analyze their choices on page 131. Tell students that each individual has a responsibility to learn about conditions in his environment that can affect his safety, security, and well-being. And assign pages 132 and through 134 for homework. Um, so, and that, that's an interesting point there that they make about 
the conditions, learning about the conditions of our environment. Because obviously there's not tornadoes there in every part of the world. There's not hurricanes in every part of the world. In fact, in some parts of the world, they're called cyclones. <laughs> same thing, different name, because it's in a different part of the world. But it's the same concept, same thing. We'll learn about that later in the chapter as well. We're going to learn a lot in this chapter, okay? You're just kind of getting a preview of what you're going to see. Because there's some things that you're going to learn in this chapter that go way deeper than what I'm talking about. And I hope you watch those, uh, those videos I asked you to. I put a link up there on the Facebook page after the class. I put two links up there on those videos I asked you to watch. Because I know they were hard to find, but I put them up there for you. Remember, it was... Uh, uh, Trinity and Beyond was the first one, and the second one was Nukes in Space, the Rainbow Bombs. And those links are on the uh, Peaceful Solution page from last class. I put them at the top there in the comments if you'd like to watch those, because you're going to need that information to understand what is causing this earth, uh, the stress to this earth. What has mankind done? Okay, but that's not for tonight. Okay, we will be hearing about it. So, let's turn over to page 132 and or yeah, 130 and test our disaster knowledge. Okay? You got a test. Were you expecting a test? Well, you should have prepared. Remember, preparation. You got to prepare for the test. If you don't if you don't, you're going to be all shook up like you are right now. I can see you all going, "Oh, no, we got a test. I didn't even know we were going to take a test." I know it's not that bad, but okay. How much do you know about safety in times of disaster? Take the following quiz to test your knowledge. So, uh, uh, here's one great thing about this test. You're going to pass it, okay? <laughs> you know how? Because we're going to give you the answers. Not yet, but we're going to give you the answers. Let's go to the first slide. Let's look at the first question. So, this is going to be a hard one too, okay? You ready? If you're at home when an earthquake starts... You should A, run outside, B, get underneath a sturdy piece of furniture like a dining table, or C, stay in bed and pull the covers over your head. Well, who, who said C? <laughs> okay, well, that's if you're in uh, what they call, uh, you're an ostrich with his head in the sand. That's what you would do, right? Okay. <laughs> or if you're a deer in the headlights, that's what you would do. Okay. All right. What do you think the answer is? Shout it out. Who said B? You are correct. B. Yes, B. Get underneath a sturdy piece of furniture like a dining table because when falling objects are falling, if you're under something sturdy, more than likely it's going to break on top of the table, not on top of your head. Right? You got to protect your body, your, light, your head and the other parts of your body. All right, you did great there, see? I told you it's not going to be that hard. But the next one's a little tougher, okay? Let's go to number two. During a lightning storm, you should A, talk on the phone, B, go swimming, or C, neither of the above. C? Who said C? Boy, that's a young man. How old are you? Eight? Eight years old, you got it right. Great job. Excellent. C, neither of the above. <laughs> In fact, you know, I'm, I'm always shocked. Well, no pun intended, but I sometimes watch people like here in Texas. We got some strong lightning, okay? And I, lightning, I don't like getting by windows. I don't get by doors. I don't get by anywhere. I'm in the middle of the room. I don't like lightning. In fact, it's not that I fear lightning, but I respect it because I know how powerful it is, okay? And I know that you don't get by windows and you don't stand outside in the parking lot like a lightning rod, which I see some people do. And while there's a huge lightning storm, you know, bolts crashing, you know, like just a few feet away, they're standing out there talking. I'm like, okay, you know, and you might think, well, you know, I'm, you know, nothing's going to occur to me, you know, I'm protected, yeah? You're protected because you follow the rules. The rule is get inside, stay away from windows, okay? Don't test that lightning, okay? Because you can very quickly become a lightning rod, okay? All right. 
I think I've made my point. All right, so, so C, yes. Number three, let's go to number three. Dur or, uh, the emergency broadcast system is A, a warning system that lets people know that there's possible danger, or B, a loud beep that comes on the radio or TV, or C, both of the above. Who said A? Okay, you, you need to study a little more for the next exam, okay? Because you are wrong. <laughs> a is not the right answer. Who, who knows the answer? Shout it out. C, both of the above. That's right. It's a warning system that lets people know that there's... Po and I think they call it something else now. This book is a little bit older, but it's called uh, the Something Broadcast. It's... Uh, somebody help me out. It's not emergency broadcast anymore. It's That's NBC. That's a TV station. Oh, man. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to figure it out. I'll tell the next teacher to bring it out. <laughs> but it, they call it, it's something, be, it's something broadcasting system. Broadcasting. No, it's the emergency alert system is what it's called. Yeah, emergency alert system. Okay, so they call it something different, but it's the same concept. Remember, this book was written in 2003, so, but it's the same concept. It's a warning that lets people know there's a possible danger, and it's a loud beep that comes on the radio or TV, okay? All right, number four. You guys are pretty great. Let's see if you can get this one right. During a hurricane, you should A, get into a closet or interior room and stay there until the hurricane has passed, B, quickly run outside to put away your bike, or C, look out the window to see what's going on. <laughs> A, A, okay, you got it. A, that's right. Children, don't go bike riding during a hurricane, okay? Or don't go out to pick up your bike. The time to prepare for the hurricane was before the hurricane came. How long do you have a warning before a hurricane comes? At least a week. You know, at least a week. They have a tracking. Uh, they show the track of the hurricane for at least a week ahead of time. Now, they might not know exactly where it's going to make landfall, but they can pretty much estimate how it's going to go and where it's going to turn. For the most part, they're pretty accurate. So, preparation. Get your bike in the garage. And you possibly strap it down in case the garage blows away, right? <laughs> but make your preparations beforehand. Okay, did a great job. Hey, okay, so let's go to number five. Biological warfare is when A, certain diseases affect man, animals, and plants at the same time. B, biologists get really angry. Or C, germs that cause diseases are used as weapons. C, are you sure? You are correct. C is for correct. You're right. C, yes, germs that cause diseases are used as weapons. Sad to say, but yes, they do. And they store these things. Even the United States has germ chemical weapons stored away. Okay? Um, let's go to number six. If there was a power outage, I would A, stumble around in the dark, B, play blind man's bluff, or C, know exactly where my candles, matches, and flashlight are located. That's right. That's right. You should know exactly where your candles, your matches, your flashlight, or your little headlamp, or whatever you got, is located so you can see, right? So you can see. Yes, correct answer, C. All right. Number seven. Anthrax is... A, the name of a foreign toothpaste. B, a deadly bacteria used in biological warfare. Or C, another name for an erupting volcano. Well, when I was growing up, it was the name of a heavy metal band. 
I didn't even know what anth I didn't know anthrax was a biological agent until uh, I think the September 11th attacks. Somebody was sending anthrax and envelopes to some of the senators on Capitol Hill. Okay, so uh, who said? What's the answer? B. B. Yes, a deadly bacteria used in biological warfare. That's what anthrax is. Okay, number eight. You guys are getting really great here. A terrorist is A, a really mean person, B, any person who uses terror as a way to force others to do his or her will, or C, a person from another country studying the effects of terror. B? Oh, man, you guys are awesome. You guys must have prepared for this test somewhat, right? Okay, so yeah, B, any person who uses terror, like threats of violence or violence itself, guns, knives, bombs, uh, weapons of any sort, including your tongue, as a way to force others to do his or her will. That's correct. Great, B. All right, number nine. When you get scared, you A, freeze like a deer caught in the headlights of a car, B, scream hysterically and run as fast as you can, or C, remain calm so you can think clearly. <laughs> you know what that actually ought to say? When you get scared, you should, <laughs> because what do we really do sometimes when we get scared? We don't do C. <laughs> we look like that deer in the headlights right there. You see, that's what we look like sometimes. We all running frantically trying to figure out, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, when you're prepared, you don't look like the deer in the headlights. You're a lot more calmer because, and, you know, there's going to be some adrenaline going. Don't get me wrong. You know, you're in the middle of a situation, especially if it's totally unexpected, which some things can be totally unexpected. You still have to remain calm. Remember the STOP acronym? You got to stop. And I don't mean stop moving and doing what you need to do to get where you need to go or do what you need to do in that sense, in that sense. but you got to stop and let your mind, let that emotion of fear calm down so you can think clearly, what do I need to do right now? What am I going to need to do? So you can, you can make the right choice, okay? All right, I got one more. I don't know if you guys can handle this one because this is a tough one. Okay, number 10. You're alone in an elevator and suddenly it stops between floors. You A, start screaming and banging on the doors. B, stay calm and read the sign that explains what to do in case of an emergency. Or C, try to pry open the doors. B. All right. Man, this is great. Even the children know what to do already. They, you must be a peaceful solution student. You must have taken this class before, right? So responsibility? <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you stay calm, read the sign that what explains what to do. In every elevator, there should be one of those, unless it's one of those old hotels where it's all decrepit and they don't keep anything in there. And <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but stay calm and read the signs. And... You know, I got to tell you a story because I, when I was living in Houston, Texas, in the medical, uh, I was working in the medical business, and a doctor was getting off. A, a doctor was getting off. These are how dangerous elevators can be. A doctor was getting off an elevator, or he was trying to get on the elevator. Is what he was trying to do. He was trying to get in or out. I don't remember, but the doors closed on him. The doors closed on the doctor and trapped them in the doors and it started going up. Decapitated them. That's how dangerous an elevator can be if you're not careful. You don't play with elevators. You know, you don't try to beat the door or try to hold the door. Or, you know, you don't play with things like that because you can actually get hurt in an elevator. There's something to take serious too. And, and when you're a Peaceful Solutions student, you always think safety first, right? Okay, 
So you did a really great job on that test. Now, there, we got a couple wrong, so we got to work on those, right? But for the most part, we did a pretty great job. So let's analyze our answers. Go ahead and put up the uh, slides so we can analyze the answers. It says, so how did you do? This questionnaire is designed to test your knowledge of disaster preparedness as well as how you might react in times of crisis. If you answered A to question 4, B to question 1, 7, 8, and 10, and C questions and C to questions 2, 3, 5, and 6, and 9, congratulations. You have a great deal of disaster savvy. If you answered any of these incorrectly, then realize that a lack of knowledge in times of disaster could result in tragedy. So you got to take it serious. You know, we got to know what we need to do. Questions 9 and 10, which was the question regarding when you get scared and you start, you know, when you're in a situation where you're frightened. It says, questions 9 and 10 are designed to gauge your response to stressful situations. When frightened or anxious, as is common in times of disaster, it's natural to cry, scream, or go into shock. But these reactions could be dangerous for you and others with you. Even in the middle of a crisis, it's best to remain calm and level-headed. As difficult as that might be, the only way to stay in control when the natural tendency is to lose it is to be prepared. Be prepared. And you know, um, part of that preparation, I told you, is character development. That means um, what we need to do is we need to practice that STOP acronym about stopping, thinking, in any situation. You know, any stressful situation, we should be practicing that, stopping and thinking. Weighing, so we can weigh out our options and proceed with the right choice. So if we do that constantly in our everyday dealings, we should be getting the practice we need for situations that are stressful like these. Talking about uh, extreme weather events, earthquakes. Uh, I don't think you're going to see any tsunamis here. <laughs> uh, there's only a few lakes around, so I don't think you need to worry about the tsunamis. Uh, but nuclear war is a possibility, isn't it? You know, it, you know, I, I hate to say it, but that's this is what they're talking about, you know. And how many years have we been warned about nuclear war? <laughs> how many years have we been told to prepare for nuclear war? How long have they had nuclear bombs? Since 1940 when? 1934, you're, you're correct. That's when they patented the first nuclear bomb. Great job. And how old are you, son? Eight. Okay, that tells me somebody's getting an education here. Great job. Okay, so, yeah, that's when they patented the first bomb and they blew it up 11 years later in 1945, July 16th. So we've had 70... How many years now? 70, 80 years? Almost 90 years? Somebody's a math whiz out there too, great. Okay, so yeah, we've had a quite a while to prepare. And now we're being told, you know, constantly in the news, nuclear war is a possibility. So we should be, we should be preparing, getting educated about what we're gonna need for something like that. And the other teachers that are coming behind me are going to prepare us. They're going to tell us everything we need to know. But remember, the most important thing, I cannot stress it enough, the most important thing that we really need to focus on for preparedness in any emergency, whether it's, whether it's an earthquake or a nuclear war, is our character. If our character is not right, we might not make it. Okay? But if we have a positive moral character, we have a much greater opportunity of surviving, okay? Because a moral character means you're going to be responsible and you're going to prepare. You're going to practice self-control to prepare yourself. You're going to do all these things that we've been learning. You're going to put them into action so you can be prepared for the stressful events that are going to come on this earth. All right, so... Let's go to the next slide in my waning moments here. 
It says, how can I be responsible for my safety when disasters are usually unexpected? Um, the key word in the question is usually. Usually does not mean always. In other words, not every disaster is unexpected. You can be given advance warnings, but it's up to you to pay attention to the warnings and take them seriously. For example, the weather bureaus often know days in advance when the dangerous storm is approaching an area. Having a plan and being prepared can make a big difference to your survival. In the event that you are in an unexpected disaster, knowing what to do, being prepared, and having a plan is still the best way to avoid tragedy. Having a plan. Being prepared. Having that plan. You know, we, we, we really need to, to know our environment, know what to expect here in Texas or wherever you live, know what kind of disasters take place in those areas and prepare for them. But at whatever area you're in, prepare for nuclear war because that can affect every area. Nuclear war, and not, not only if they hit your city with a bomb, the fallout from the other cities that get hit with these bombs is going to have an effect on your area. It doesn't matter where you live. No matter what hemisphere you're on, doesn't matter either. Some people think they're going to be safe if they run to Argentina or Brazil or no. The scientists that did the uh, the uh, simulations and did the, did all the uh, thinking on this said doesn't matter what hemisphere you're on, you're going to be affected. So finally, let's go to the final slide I have for the night. It's a cold hard fact, but that's a pretty hot bomb. That, that's uh, I think uh, I told you this: the surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees, but those. Uh, uh, nuclear bombs are about 15 million degrees when you're under them. 15 million degrees. Now here's a cold hard fact that we need to keep in our mind. We are living in uncertain times. This means that with the invention of weapons of mass destruction coupled with disease epidemics which, by the way, when a nuclear bomb goes off, more people will die afterwards than will in the initial blasts. From famine, from disease epidemics, from lack, you know, lack of food and water, from, from the death everywhere, and the different germs and viruses that are going to be unleashed because of dead bodies laying everywhere. It says... Weapons of mass destruction coupled with disease epidemics, civil unrest, distrust and anger between nations, inactive volcanoes suddenly becoming active, and unpredictable weather patterns, it is wise to expect the unexpected. It's wise to expect the unexpected. We're living in very uncertain times, very exciting times, you know, if you're a peaceful solution student, because you're being prepared. You shouldn't be afraid. You should be aware, educated, be prepared, be prepared, and be here at these classes like you're doing because uh, Katan, David, Chris got a lot of great information lined up for you that's coming up in coming, in coming classes. In fact, the next class, we're going to be back on 5-9, that's Sunday, 5-9-2024 at 5.30 p.m. Central Time, Central Standard Time, Please be here and we'll pick up, what, where, where did we make it to? What page was that? Come on. 131? Okay, we made it through 131 or to 131? Through, so we'll be on 132. Correct? All right, we'll see you next class. Have a great evening.